<clears throat> so the nature of everything is love. There's every body mind mechanism will have different associations with what they think love is. Um, and then maybe through this talk, I'll begin to point to what I mean as love. But the nature of everything is love. This love is always here, in everything that appears, in everything that ever happens. It's always love. The appearance of the light now is love. The appearance of the room is love. The appearance of the body mind, the, the other bodies, is love. The breeze on the skin, the breath in the nose, the air in the nose, the touch of the warm cup is all love. It's the nature of everything. The bomb on the seat is love. The rubbing of the skin is love. All of it is appearing in love. The reason why it doesn't always feel like that for the human being is because the human being has dreamt of separation, it's dreamt of separating itself from life, from the world. And this energy focuses on a person in time. So this energy focuses on someone moving through time dealing with life. And as soon as this separation happens, which is normally quite young in the human body, life begins to feel uncomfortable and a search begins to make life feel better and more comfortable. As soon as these false ideas about you being something separate from life appear, life begins to feel uncom oh, uncomfortable. And it tends to feel uncomfortable in this area, between in the torso and the head area, particularly the torso. It feels like you are in there and you are relating with life. And every time life doesn't give you what you want or life disappoints you, it hurts. It feels like you're in here and life is hurting you. And you feel like you're in relationship with life and it's your job to stop life hurting you. And it seemingly grows over time. As a very young child, it's not so strong. I think the identification starts at maybe two years old, but I don't really know. And then it grows over time, this identification of being separate, of being somebody <laughs> inside the body. And more and more ideas about who you are, what you need life to be, what you want from life, what other people should give you begin to grow and all of us remember maybe being five or six years old and the identification wasn't that heavy and life was very simple and there was playing there was playing although it was already started but it wasn't so heavy when there was crying there was crying when there was joy there was joy but it wasn't really happening to someone and you didn't really have any ideas of what life should be. There was just life happening. And then seemingly over the years, through being taught by others and own, your own ideas growing, 
and by watching films and the media, you begin to learn of things that you need in order to make you happy, what you need others to be, how they should treat you, how they shouldn't treat you, uh, what you need your circumstance to, to be like, like what you um, need your environment to be like, what you need to show to others. You need to show others niceness or wealth or joy or suffering. Some people identify with the pain. You need to show people you suffer the most, whatever it is. Or you need to show others you're popular or maybe unpopular. Who knows what the identification identifies with, with the separate person identifies with. And so this energy keeps growing of you in relationship to life. And as that a seeming divide happens, life becomes more and more uncomfortable and more and more caged to ideas of what you think you know about the world and yourself. And rather than it just appearing and being free to appear as it is, it's conditioned to your belief systems and your ideas about life. Okay, when I say you're, it's conditioned, I mean, it's like a, you need life to fit in with the way you see life. And over time, it hurts more life, I think. I think as that separate entity, that one that thinks it's experiencing life grows, I think life hurts more and more. Like more and more things are noticed to be imperfect. More and more situations aren't good enough. More and more situations aren't it. <coughs> now all of this is appearing in love, even the separate self, even the discomfort, all of it is love. But the appearance of the separate self gives the appearance or makes it feel like it's not love. It makes it feel tight and contracted and limited. And when it seems to get to a certain point, life begins to get questioned. There seems to be a point in a lot of body-mind mechanisms where maybe they've got all the things they want, or maybe they've lost something very dear to them, where they begin to question why they're alive, which is quite a basic question as to why they're alive or why this is happening. And then there seems to be an exploration into spirituality or into philosophy or religions. And there's a, a, a want to know answers to why this is happening. And it's just that the energy has shift focus from looking at it in material things to looking at it into, in ideas. So now you've realized maybe that the flow of life is very unpredictable and it doesn't make you happy like everyone told you. You were told when you got the house or the kids or the lover, you would be happy. And you begun to realise, okay, that's not true. So then the focus then goes maybe onto a more intellectual or spiritual experience. Maybe by understanding life or an energetic spiritual experience. So then a focus goes on to this, and I'm sure even non-duality would fit into what I've just described. And then there's a hope that you will find answers in that and still that won't lead you to freedom because nothing can lead you to freedom because you're already free as you are your nature is love but the mind can only look in two in opposites so that the thought process keeps looking in the flow of life and either looking for enlightenment or looking for um spirituals awakening is still looking in ideas there's something that's here that's so intimate and when i say something that's really bad english that i'm putting it into because it's not a thing but there's this aliveness that's always been no matter how old the body's been no matter what experiences have happened no matter how much the body's changed no matter what you've got what you lost there's been this boundless aliveness. When you've hit your head and you can't remember yourself, when you've taken loads of drugs or drunk loads of alcohol, 
and you can't remember who you are or why you did things, there's still this sense of being. It's not even a sense, it's what's always been there. And that's always overlooked by the mind. The mind always looks in what I can get um, and what I don't have. It always looks in time. It always looks in opposites. It doesn't look to itself for freedom or it doesn't look for what's happening for freedom or for happiness. It looks in the future or in the past or in a thought. What I think I know. <laughs> And it will never be found there. And this sounds like a hopeless message, but it's not really. It's only hopeless if you think it's hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it's a really beautiful message. And it's not just me that's speaking. I'm not like, oh, Lisa's message is beautiful. This non-duality is appearing more and more in Western societies. And it's basically pointing back to what's always here what always is, what's always been free. And what might happen in these talks is not an intellectual understanding, but a knowing beyond this, beyond you knowing it. And it might feel, it might give the sensation of love, or what you know as love. But still, normally the mind will look at that sensation and try and own it. It's not quite that. But... It is in what you love. Because what happens in what you love is you disappear. That's the nature of what love is. So you will get your lover or get an object and momentarily there's absolute love. But then the mind quickly comes in and says it's because of the object. But actually what the freedom was was that you disappeared there was such excitement about the object, you forgot about yourself and the world and what you thought you knew. And there was just intimacy with what is. And that's, that's what this message is. It is talking about that love, which you experience most probably when you listen to music or when you meet somebody that you feel like, or you meet somebody that you think is the perfect person, or when you're watching kids or dogs. That moment of love, you disappear. The person comes back in and says, it's in that object. And then seeking to maintain that object starts. And then you stop loving the object, actually. You start hating it. Because you feel that your love is dependent on it. <coughs> but what happened in those experiences was you forgot yourself. There was just involvement with what's happening. And this involvement is the nature of beingness. This isn't a separate world. This is um, one expression happening. And it's your expression, but not you as somebody in time, not you as a somebody, but you as that beingness that's always been there, that's timeless and still, in which all of this appears in. And this can't be intellectual. You cannot know this, yet it is. So you cannot know it as a thought or an idea, but it can be known, but not by someone. You can't know it the moment after. It's here. It's screaming it. Everything is that beingness. And everything is you, which is beingness. But every time I say you, You'll imagine a body, you'll imagine somebody, but they don't mean somebody. Who would have thought that what you looked for was in what was happening? The mind's always told you that what you're looking for is in the next moment. What you're looking for is in the idea of tomorrow. 
but also who would have thought that it's who you are, that what you're looking for is who you are. Which, in a way, everything I'm saying, I'm constantly contradicting myself because I can't quite say it. But there might be this buzzing, this knowing what's being talked about, which isn't intellectual. And this really isn't an intellectual message. Non-duality can sound so intellectual. It's really, it really doesn't, doesn't need a very quick mind. Can be people with really quick minds, but it's not understanding non-duality isn't it. I always thought that it was <coughs> going to be an understanding, that there would be this flash of intellectual understanding and then I would get it. It really is in that way. The internet is a dual part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's the birthright, so how could it need the intellect to remember it? It's just as the person that thinks it knows things begins to clear, all those ideas of what you think you know who pass like clouds just clearing, there it is. Even the clouds are it too though, but just, they seem to limit it. And what seems to happen in a lot of body-mind mechanism now is an energy changes where it shifts from you being a separate person in time, and that's who you are. It shifts to this aliveness, this boundless freedom, which everything, instead of before, it was like, I'm moving through time and I'm separate from this world. That energy shifts back to this boundless freedom that is everything and no one thing. And then the character appears in it, but the character is not who you are. So the Lisa character or these characters still appear, but they're not the, the leading role anymore. They're not the one, that's not the one who you are. And it's an energetic change. It's not, a, it's not an intellectual thing of seeing awareness or consciousness. It's not an understanding of this. It's an energetic change from being this contracted self to, to this what's happening. But in another way, there never really is an energetic contraction, so it never really can be an energetic sh shift. It just appears that way. There's never really a limited person. It just seems that there's a limited person appearing. That energy which is appearing now in the body saying, I'm in here and I'm in relationship with the world, is never really happening. It seems like it is, though. This is so exciting, this message. You never needed anything to complete you. You never needed to find something in life to have a good life. It's not the way you think it is. Your problems aren't in the flow of life. Your problem is, is that you think you exist separate, separately from life.
So the thoughts might be coming up with problems. This is uncomfortable. Why am I feeling uncomfortable? I don't want to feel uncomfortable. I want to be somewhere else. I want to be doing something else. And that's okay. That's appearing. Then the mind comes up with a solution. Well, if I leave or stand up, or if I ask a question, or if this happens, then this will feel better. And that's a lie. That's the lie. You don't know. You don't even know who you are, let alone what's going to help you. <laughs> All these assumptions that you've begun to make about yourself and what you know is right. I assure you always, no matter what's happening, even if the worst situation which we could possibly imagine, yesterday I was beheading. <laughs> so, <laughs> the worst situation, it's your freedom is always your nature, no matter what's happening. And this isn't an escape. This isn't something removed back here like a witness. This is an intimacy with everything. It's so intimate that there's not even a sense that the beheader or the one that's beheaded is separate from you. There's no escape from it. It's all you. And the freedom is it, which is what is, what's appearing. This really isn't an escape. So it's full on facing everything no longer denying what's happening by this shouldn't be happening, they're a bad person, why are they doing this? It's a full-on experiencing of what's happening. When I say full-on, it doesn't translate properly. Full-on in English is when you drive a car very fast, like full throttle, like it's totally, you're totally in it. Like when you drive the car fast, you can't be imagining something better. It's just You've got to totally drive the car. The car will crash if you started imagining you were flying an aeroplane, or how much better flying an aeroplane would be. <laughs> so if there's discomfort arising, the mind then tells the story to avoid the discomfort, what could be better and what the problem is. And that's perfect if it's appearing. It's just not true. It's just not true. There's no truth in it. Your freedom is here, always. When I first heard this message, it was a lot easier to hear than what I'm saying. Like, uh, I think that this is in all religions. And I first studied Buddhism. And they, they used to put it in the language of you've got to be in the moment. And then eventually you realise that that's an impossibility. The you is always dreaming of past and future. It's an impossibility being in the moment. But there was a sense that really resonated with what was being said. That what was happening was where the freedom was. It was never in what I thought should be happening. It was always in this. It was always in what's appearing. Because we never have anything else than what appears. We never have the past and future. We never have this better promised land. We never have the next moment. We always have this with the imagination of it appearing. And this isn't something I'm trying to convince you of, even though I'm beginning to get passionate. <laughs> ah! <laughs> um, this, is, this is an energetical thing. A remembering. This is something that you, but it's not a personal thing, that you've always known. that I know of and those that I have experienced to be a distraction from it, kind of workarounds, 
with lots of tasks and levels to achieve, like computer games, mm. and um, but never really being it. Yeah. Either because um, people enjoy having the power, leading people certain ways, and uh, selling some sort of solution. And most of the time, it's because those teachers don't understand what they're talking about. Mm. They don't have a sense of what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, it works like societal constructions. That's yeah. how the religions work. Yeah. Also keeping keeping the humans running and running and running for rewards yeah. and levels and solutions and enlightenment, which they can only kind of reach if somebody says yes, <laughs> yeah. you are, I can see it, you're so enlightened, rather than just being in it. But also all rejection of that, like all rejection of that is an impossibility because everybody that you've ever seen and experienced, every idea of religion is you. So we can't, yeah. we can't even reject that play that's happening. Like it's like your dream at night. Mm -hmm. It's all, it's all it. It's not like there's been somebody separately out there that's created it apart from you. Yeah. It's all being. Oh. <laughs> I walked a couple of these paths, but they didn't leave me. I didn't feel at home. Yeah. It was like there's still something out there that Yeah. <laughs> the seeking mode yeah. that kind of never ended. And uh, yeah. Lisa? Yeah. When you say this is it? Yeah. And then you um, tell things, then it's it's already after after what it is what you mean actually because as soon as you label, yeah, it's it gets uh, conceptual. Yeah, it's before labeling. Yeah, yeah. Or or during the light labeling without any idea about it, like. Uh, like even when you speak, when you're labeling something, it's in the sounds rather than the meaning. Yeah, but as soon as I see, I, um, as I say, um, I speak, it's a label yeah. already. Yeah. It's too late then, it's yeah. before that. But labeling is kind of automatic, it works yeah. automatic. Yeah. And is uh, labeling still happening with you? I don't know what you associate with labeling. It's when you name it. If you if you have you hear sound, yeah. somebody speaks, you can before you before you break uh, reduce it down to speaking is happening. That's already a label. It's the most reduced label possible, maybe. Sound is happening. Yeah. Um, but it's already a label because it's it's it comes after after the, the sensation and it's named already. Yeah, but it's not a problem actually. The problem is when you take yourself to be a label and the world to be a label. But labeling has to happen in functioning of human, in the functioning of human in order to communicate in our society. So we have to be able to describe the salt, to pass the salt or whatever it is. So that's not a sign that there's still a somebody no, the sign is that pain of contraction and somebody knowing that contraction. You know what, it's so hard to say, like if I say you know what I mean, like who knows. Because it's like, it's this sense of feeling trapped inside of the body, this suffering. Not pain or pleasure, not like that, but it's the sense of feeling like there's something not quite right and it physically hurts. And it gets more and less during the day, seemingly. Sometimes physical events seem to activate it, and sometimes nothing at all, and there's just a strong sense of discomfort. 
which I cannot feel because it's normal to me. I don't have a comparison how it yeah. feels without it. So, so it doesn't come to my mind if this feels contracted or not. Yeah. It's only if it's if I if I get scared or something like that, then it's really really uh, obvious for me that I contract. But like this, I don't feel like contracted. But I cannot compare because <laughs> I don't know how it is without contraction. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. For you, there's a sense of this um, this um, This melting, like melting into to things, like you're not sure where you begin and the world begins. You're not sure of. It's just <laughs> mysterious. But I think that the contraction is always like a the contraction of self gets less and more during seemingly as times moving. It's not really moving, but. During the day, it feels like it gets stronger and less. But mo a lot of the time, you won't e there won't even be you there thinking about it. There'll be like uh, doing your art or driving the car, and there won't even be a thought about this subject. in time but you you don't really have a sense of it most of it's, it's just involvement with what's happening like a kid like when there's eating there's eating when there's um, dancing there's dancing when there's laughing there's laughing and it, it feels like the best descriptive word for it is love and intimacy was what is there's no longer me dancing in the world me relating with the world me, the good person here, and then the bad person. There's just love appearing so intimately. You're not, you have no sense of inside and outside anymore. But then when you talk about it in groups like this, or when you're describing something, then there's a before and an after, but that's all nonsense, really. It's so irrelevant most of the day, and most of the important thing is what's happening. Always. It's the only thing that ever is, is what's happening. And I wanted to share um, a little quote from a girlfriend. She yes, is four years old, uh, my little daughter. She was waking up in the morning and she was half asleep still. And she said, um, death is easy and life is light. <laughs> and some hours later during the day she said, death is easy and life is difficult. <laughs> so a change. Uh, this was a child that said this? She's four years old, yeah. Oh, wow. Really nice. <laughs> this is very easy what's being talked about. It's hard for that person that wants to continuously be something and find a solution to the problems. It doesn't want just life to be as it is, it wants to find a solution. But it is very easy in the sense of when you're falling asleep at night and everything's beginning to disappear, there's no fear, there's no problem there. The only problem is if you begin to imagine that you don't experience again. It's only when you begin to think about it. But in the moment where everything's falling away, of what you've been, how good you've been, what you've done, it's nice as you begin to, as that disappearing begins to happen. And the waking up, when you wake up and you're not sure who you are or where you are, that sometimes can be scary actually. The identity comes back in and tries to grip onto something.
We'll take another short break now. Just like 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll start again. This is it! I get so excited by it. <laughs> this is all it's ever going to be. Great! <laughs> <laughs> May I say something? Yeah. Um, what I experienced, please, I'm sorry, but I have to tell, um, is just that what you're talking is also just arising. Yeah. And so what? Yeah. I'm sorry, Lisa, I'm saying it this way, but this is what I experienced. But, the, but that's, that's the, that's the, well, there's two ways you can look at it. That's exactly it in the sense of, like there's no place to sit. It's not like these words are more important. But when that contracted energy is tightly there, then it might be, but it also might not be, that there's a remembering as we speak of this freedom that's happening. But then eventually it comes to a point where non-duality is no, there's n no better. There's nothing that's more important at all. Like everything that appears is it and not it. So even there comes a point which is a sweet point where even the pointing out of it is nothing it's all it it's all appearances arising so you're right and this is what i love about so many speakers at the moment is some people say this is a negative thing but there's so much debunking of different speakers going on there's such an important part to reject it as well not reject it harshly but where this is no more it this is no more important. But when the energy is tighter, sometimes this can really seem like it's reminding. And then also there can just be a joy of hearing it. Like I still hear it when there's specific speakers speaking. And it's not really what they're saying, it's just a resonance with the energy of the joy and the freedom. And that's so nice to see. Yeah, this is what there is, but there is a realization that it is just... Appearances, yeah. appearances, appearances, yeah, always. <coughs> But, but there's just nothing you can hold on to or reject. Like in whatever's appearing, like it's just, it's just coming, going, coming, going. This is sometimes what I like about just sitting with people, not that it's a practice in any way, but it's, there's just, there's, even in anything I say, there's nothing to get, and in anything that's thought, it's the same functioning really. These words that seem to come out here and thoughts that appear, it's all happening in this. But the, the mind is so used to hanging on to something, like this is more it. And if you were to hang on to these words, then it would be like hanging on to a thought, onto a thought that's saying this is bad or something. It's all a coming and going. And the fact that it's coming and going is where the love affairs are. Like it's all just appearing and disappearing and there's no thing to hold on to at all. And yet there's everything. It's so relaxing. Yeah. Your nature, the nature of everything is that it's just this. These human bodies got confused, and then because the other body mechanisms believe it as well, there's been this pressure to identify with certain things and to have problems. There's even pressure to have problems. Like you go out with friends that have never been into this subject, and if you don't have a problem, there's nothing to talk about. You're like. <laughs> <laughs> God, I think it's like here. <laughs> like. <laughs> and it's not, I don't mean to deny the movement of the body. The movements of the body will always be towards pleasure over the pain, that's a natural movement, so there will always be preferences. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the one that's looking for something in pleasure and pain. The one that's looking to hold on to pleasure and fear certain things appearing. <coughs> that energy that's like super glue. And, this, and I'm not talking about perfect action or a certain behavior. It's just the absence of that one that's gluing onto anything. Like, um, even the, like this, it's easier to talk with the eyes shut about this. So there is thoughts appearing maybe, like a thoughts 
maybe interpreting what I'm saying, what Lisa's saying. And then there's also Lisa's words appearing as well. There's seemingly internal thoughts and external thoughts. That's the, the personal self will claim the thoughts to be a somebody, to be yours, to be who you are, and Lisa's words to be something external to you. And this is what begins to collapse. And then as that begins to collapse, there's nothing that seem um, to be you and to be important for you, to add to you, because there is no you there. There's just appearances happening. And I say just, and I don't mean to dis dismiss it, it's beautiful. So the idea that there's Lisa's voice out here and your internal thoughts was only ever an idea you were taught. And then an energy has held on to a certain thing, the thoughts. But this is a completely different way to what humans are used to looking at life. This morning I was in tears from laughing with myself, standing in the bathroom, putting my makeup on, and I was just like, oh look, I'm decorating my body mind mechanism. <laughs> Felt a bit like a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the body carries on doing the very mundane, regular thing. <laughs> like when the mind doesn't do on to thoughts? It just comes and goes. Yeah. So they just kind of go, what happens when that glue's there is that particular ideas get stuck. So, and it will be a pattern normally, like it will be a pattern of ideas. So it depends on what, how the body mind mechanism is conditioned. So it will get stuck on worrying ideas if it's been conditioned to worry, mm. or it will get, um, it will get stuck on the idea that a particular person is going to make you feel better and so it will keep imagining this person and <clears throat> trying to get to this person, trying to get attention and it's just a shift to your freedom, it's always this moment, it's never in anything that appears and we often with the thoughts that feels like who you are, that you're somebody in the movement of thought, thoughts, the one that's choosing the one that's saying don't worry, or the one that's worrying, that feels like a position of somebody, as if life's happening to that person. But those thoughts are appearing in this huge space in which all the bodies appear, in which the light appears, in which the sound of this voice appears. But the energy glues on and goes, okay, I'm worried. And then it feels like there's somebody here that's worried, rather than it just being empty, just appearing and disappearing. And then there's that which is outside of you, that is outside of me. They shouldn't do that. And then there's projection of somebody externally acting. And we spend so much time thinking they're bad, they're wrong, they shouldn't do this to me. And there's this focus on me and then this person that's relating to me and doing wrong or right things. And neither are true. And the only, the only way this is known, this isn't an intellectual thing, even though I seem to be speaking about it, is in this instant. Is there anybody experiencing <coughs> this? And is there anybody out there? This is not about what you think. You won't find the answer in thoughts. You'll only find it right here. And right here is just boundlessness or love.
nothing's true, no matter what the thoughts say. The only thing there ever is, is what's happening. You won't find it outside of what's happening. No matter what discomforts are appearing, it's not true. But getting something else or doing something else will get rid of it. Discomfort, if there is discomfort, is appearing in boundlessness. It's appearing and no separate from the words that Lisa's speaking. It's appearing in the same place. It's not appearing for somebody inside a body. It's not appearing for somebody that's had 20 years of suffering or who's got to fix the problems for tomorrow. It's not appearing in someone that's only got 20 years left of life and needs to have a happy life. That's the illusion. It's just appearing in this. And your nature is this. You won't find peace in trying to make people a certain way. It will just lead to hell. You will never be able to contain anything. Yet everything appears in this and is this. sound of the birds, there's a movement, the sound of the movement, there's people speaking, there's me, Lisa speaking, and all of it's appearing in this, and disappearing in this. It's not appearing for somebody, it's not appearing to somebody. That is all what you imagine. It's appearing in freedom. It's not outside of you, nor inside of you. It's appearing in this. Suffering has been that story that you are somebody moving through time with a description of a body that seemingly moves through time 
but that's not who you are, that's something that comes and goes. And it is you in the sense it's appearing, but it's not solely who you are. You aren't a limited body watching the world. May I ask you something? Yeah, sure. Um, I like the thought of, of this, this concept of being intimate at the moment. Yeah. And my mind is very quick about uh, making a problem out of it <laughs> by saying, let's say there is a situation where your gut is telling you to leave. Yeah. Um, According to your concept, it's a lost opportunity to be intimate with the moment, right? Um, not necessarily. The problem actually isn't the gut telling you to leave or not telling you to leave or the body telling you to do something or not. The problem is the one that thinks it can see the gut's reaction. That's the one that's stopping it being intimate with the moment. Who is that one that thinks it can see the gut's reaction? We've always taken that that's who we are. We're the person looking at the world. We're the person looking at experience. And we've never questioned who we are. And it always comes back to who is the one that thinks it knows that the gut is having this reaction. So there's nothing wrong with moving away from a situation. That's the way the body works. I have a dog and if she's um, scared, she'll move away from the situation. But the human, builds this dynamic that it thinks that it knows who it is, that person that's watching the gut, and it thinks it knows what to do or what not to do, and it thinks it is the one controlling life. And so the question always comes back to who are you? Who is the one that watches the gut? Who is the one creating the gut? <laughs> well, yeah. That's, um, that's actually who you are, the one that's creating the gut. But you've taken yourself to be the one watching the gut. Can you explain that, please? Oh, it's really, it's really hard to explain it to me. <laughs> so, so, um, so when the energetic contraction of self happens, it feels like you are watching the world from inside the body, right? It feels like there's a position of you, a position to you, and it feels like often you're the one having the conversation with yourself in the head. And you're the one saying, should I act on the gut? Or should I do this? Or should I tell him he's an ass? Or should I go and do this? Or this is great, I love this. You feel like you're kind of that one that's having a conversation with itself. And sometimes, and sometimes you split into two, that person. Sometimes there's one that's, oh, don't do this, and then do do this. You kind of are always having a conversation with yourself and you feel like you can imagine yourself as well. You feel like you know where you've been and you know where you're going. Like um, you watch yourself from outside the body and you can remember things that that body's done. And it all feels tied into that person that feels like it's inside the head somewhere or inside the body. And we've taken that to be who we are and that's the illusion of self. Um, so we've taken ourselves to be a position somewhere and this energy is formed to make it really feel like there's somebody inside this body watching the world when actually there's nobody inside the body there's just the world 
and who you are is the world is a complete misidentification. When that illusion of self collapses, um, the body just, the body start. I think when people are teaching, they often teach this idea of intuition. It's not that the body's working off intuition, but it's not working, it's not being interfered with by that person, that imaginary person that's inside the brain. So often the body's just responding instantaneously to situations. It's saying no or yes without anybody um, aware of it, anybody watching it. There's just an intimacy. So, so the question always comes, like a lot of people in Advaita always ask the question, who are you? Because the assumption has been that you are somebody that's a thought, but you don't even take yourself to be a thought. Like you don't even, you wouldn't even see that, that you're a, a thought. But you've taken yourself to be an idea rather than what's actually happening. So the one that thinks it knows to, the, or thinks it sees the experience in the gut is the actual illusion, is a dreamed or an imagination that's appearing. It's not a reality which energetically when that collapses is complete, it's a completely different experience being what is to being that imagined person. It's really, um, it's, it really eats everything you thought you knew about life. Because if that's not who you are, the one that's interpreting life, then that is completely disorientating. Because that's, that's, you've always been watching from that position and it always comes back to that person that's making sense and saying, this is right, this is wrong, look what that person did. It really feels like you're that one in there going, look what that person did, aren't they bad, I'm right, or oh my goodness, I'm so wrong, they're right. That feels, whereas actually who you are is everything that's appearing simultaneously. In traditionally, in Advaita, they would say who you are is consciousness. Um, but that's actually not true. Consciousness is just another functioning that appears, but consciousness is an easy way to, to phrase this in words because you can't find consciousness and, um, and there is, it does seem, there is something that is aware of this. There's something that knows this, appear, this is appearing without it being thought about. Like this sound appears and something registers it we thought we were registering it, but we's already a thought, and the thought can't perceive what's happening. There's something prior, this is the traditional way they do it in, in Advaita, there's something prior to thoughts. There's something that registers thought. So I understand what Lisa said is already a thought. That's already somebody thinking about themselves. There's something that's aware of that. There's something that knows that. But now what's beginning to happen more and more in Advaita is when we're not using the word consciousness so much because consciousness is actually just another word and idea and it's not really it. So a seemingly decision just happens. Yeah. And it can, it can happen in loads of ways, but it's not happening for anybody and it's no different from the movement of these bodies that happen externally. It's just seemingly when this body moves, there tends to come a feeling with it. Like there tends to come a, um, an urge and then the body moves, but we take that urge to be as who we are rather than just another thing that's appearing in this. And that's a lie, that urge isn't who you are. How do you ever create the urge to move the arm? The urge is like a, oh, that's a hard one. Urge is like an impulse. Like how do we create the urge to move the hands? How are we creating the urge to breathe or to see or to hear? But we're so convinced that we are doing that, that that is us. But how? How do we create the urge to perceive or to think? Who thinks? Thinking happens, urges happen, but so does all of this, the light, the other bodies moving. It's all happening in freedom. And this energy will change from, I'm this narrow person acting independently from everything else, 
to everything in which the person is acting in. It's a switch round that happens. <laughs> so staying in the situation or leaving the situation just happens. Yep. And there's no one there who decides anything. No. But the amazing thing about this is that it that life always perceives through a specific body-mind mechanism. <clears throat>